Okay, thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick, and it's a real pleasure for, for me to be here today. And I want to say thank you to Constantine for the opportunity, and a special thanks to Mike for lining it up for this to be possible today. And um, I had a cold day yesterday because I was down at the Kimse, and we had like sunshine, we had a leadership thing down there, and it was just awesome. And then uh, I had to get picked up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get up here in time. And I, the customer was really nice to us yesterday and uh, gave us a really nice project. So I had to promise to be the last guy to leave the bar. So interesting enough, I brought a lot of good energy with me. Uh, I got a lot of good wine and other alcoholic beverages in my body somewhere still because I haven't gotten rid of all of it. Uh, but I have had an ex ex extremely great day. It was a, an honor uh, and, a, and a pleasure to be here in, 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 in the morning. And John, uh, pick up some of your words on lean and the opportunity. It's very special for me. I have learned a whole lot today. And it's interesting because as I've observed the audience and the speakers, um, I was able to delve even more deeper into your world and the world of lean. And for me, I was getting curious at some point standing in the back uh, that, uh, about where's everybody from. So how many of you are, are from Europe, Europeans, you would call yourself? Well, that's a big contingent. That's, that's cool. A anybody from the Middle East and Africa? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, <laughs> you're the bridge. I've been in Istanbul recently. What a great place. Thank you very much. Glad that you're here. Uh, anybody from the Americas? I noticed a couple accents there. Okay, we've got that side of the room a little bit. And in the back, right on. Okay, cool. Welcome to Deutschland. I've spent a whole lot of my life here. Um, so many, you know, every, every once in a while I get asked the question, how long have you been in Germany? I go, do you want the uh, honest answer or the mathematically correct answer? The mathematically correct answer is about 30 years. Uh, the honest answer, honest answer sometimes is too long. I've been here too long because I'm turning Deutsch, okay? I'm turning Deutsch in a big, scary way. And uh, it does really strange things to me sometimes. And I, and I do have Germanic heritage, so I do stress the manic part of that Germanic heritage. And it has an influence on me. How about Asia? Do we got anybody... From, a, from the Asian side of the world at all? That's a shame. I just had two Japanese friends visit me for about a week, which was, which was awesome. It was a great experience. Um, and I do have the privilege of being there four or five times a year. So um, this Germanic thing, this, is, this has had an impact on me all my life, especially my business life. I always want to understand things in detail, totally. And when I get into the detail, it's never enough. I want more detail. I want to understand it even better. And I spent my whole life doing that. And interesting enough, I've also got an American side in me. And this was my mom and dad. My mom was always saying detail, detail, detail. And my dad was always saying, um, yes, we can screw the details. Um, and that conflict in me had a big impact on all the things I've experienced in my life. And I'm here today as Patrick, the German-American confused elderly almost gentleman here, that I want to share with you guys in the little bit of time that we've got together my vision, my dream, what moves me more than anything else the last seven years of my life. I have dedicated my life to something I believe is extraordinary, and it has a tremendous impact on the last two and a half years of everything I do and all of my friends now do. And we now do it every single day. And sharing this with you guys is really interesting because a lot of the things I heard today get really, really close to the idea that I want to share with you. A lot of the elements that I saw today, even some of them that weren't 
spoken out loud. We're very, very similar to the elements that I've dedicated the last seven years of my life to. I saw a lot of words, and some of them were Japanese. And I felt in there something deeper. Sometimes we call it philosophy. But it wasn't talking to or about so much. But it was always there. I don't know if you guys noticed. There was a lot of stuff on process and methods and research and testing and experiments and conditions. But I didn't hear the, the, the spirit word or the, the kokoro, the Japanese would say, that's underneath all that. But I do believe it's an element, and I, I felt it, but it wasn't being explicitly said. And that's kind of cool. So I'm going to do some more of the explicit stuff now. I, I'm going to try to integrate elements of everything I heard and learned, and I did learn a lot. And try on just two single slides, transport everything you represent and everything my dream is about in that 30 minutes we've got together. So I'm going to really try to do that. And hopefully, when we get to the questions and answers part, you can give me some feedback of how close I was able to bring those, those two worlds. Because they're important. Because if they don't come together we may not have as bright a future as we would like to have. And I see a great opportunity for lean to be a key element in that transition happening over the next 30 to 50 years. So I'll try as good as I can in my rusty American English my German is a whole lot better, so if you don't understand my English, then geht's sofort weiter in Deutsch, yeah? So we could do that, but we'll, we'll stick on the English side. And, um, and at the end, you know, please help me if there's something I missed when I tried to bring the connection together, because uh, I want to learn, and, and I've got some inspirational moments today that I'll try to share back. So in my 30 years of business life, I worked for companies from the Americas, from Europe and from Asia. I'm an old engineer, so I grew up uh, as a mainframe engineer for IBM mainframe computers um, and worked for a lot of technology companies. So, you know, one of those industries, which was probably the fastest growing industry of the last 50 years, I grew up in that space, working for companies from America like EMC, which is a storage company. I worked for uh, a company that became part of Hewlett Packard. Um, I was the general manager for almost five years of Dell Computer in Germany, which at the time was the largest market outside of the United States. I also had the honor and privilege of learning a lot of process stuff on SAP R3 process work. And when I was at Dell, I was fortunate enough to be green belt certified, Six Sigma and black belt trained. Um, and we leaned into lean a little bit when we did Six Sigma. So I have a touch experience on what you guys are talking about. But because of my Germanic background, the process thing is something I enjoy a lot, which is not true for everyone from the America side of the Atlantic, because we sometimes tend not to like to delve so deeply into the detail. And probably one of the most valuable experiences I had were the five years that I was the Geschäftsführer and General Manager of Hitachi Data Systems, also for Germany at the time, the second largest market outside of Japan for Hitachi. All of these learnings have influenced me significantly. I always learned by doing. I had no other opportunity than to learn by doing because I did not go to any further education after high school and my time in the United States Navy. I just basically went and did it and tried it out. And I started by putting kerosene into airplanes at Frankfurt Airport after emigrating from Chicago to Germany. And at some point, you know, I'm the general manager, vice president, and Geschäftsführer of some of these most interesting and exciting companies of the last 20, 30 years. I learned a lot. 
I learned the most, though, when I screwed things up. And I got to be honest with you, I screwed things up a whole lot. A whole lot. So in the 10 different companies I worked at, I, at the beginning, being impatient as I was, I quit my job seven times. I got fired four times. And I went insolvent with a dot-com company once. And, and that all had a big influence on me because I significantly wanted to understand how the system works, the system of the global economy, the system of capitalistic execution of business process so that every single company I went to at some point in time, we were able to go from wherever it was to the most significant growth and profitability that any one of those companies ever had in their history. At Hitachi, it was the most significant growth and profit they had in 101 years history of the company at a market of that size. At Dell, it was a $500 million business that we took to 62% growth year on year. So I invested a lot of my life, five years in a row of 80-hour weeks, because I wanted to understand what makes the system work. And I figured it out. And I'm going to share parts of that with you today. So if we go to one more slide from here, please. Thank you. So when I look at the global system today, and I look at it from the viewpoint of leadership, because for me, leadership drives significantly the behavior in every single system and organization around the world, be it a political system, uh, be it a nonprofit system, be it a company, be it the Deutsche Polizei, who we work with a whole lot in this country. Leadership has the most significant impact on anything and everything that can happen in any organi organization since we've had organized leadership, which we've had for about 150,000 years since we invented fire, pretty much, okay? And the system today, irregardless in which country you do it in, focuses almost all of its attention on driving profit and value. We would say growth, profit, and shareholder value. This is the driver for just about any system in the world, including governments that want to make sure that their economy is as viable as humanly possible. This means that irregardless of the political system, this system has established itself in almost every single country in the world, including China, including Vietnam, where my wife is from, Japan, Germany, America, everywhere. This system is so damn efficient that it has displaced any other system on the planet and drives just about everything that happens. And it drives it in an extremely competitive manner. It's all about competing with everyone else around you to be the winner, to be number one, to have the largest market share, to have a valuation of almost $500 billion like Apple has today. You want to dominate the market. You want to make sure that no one else gets close to how good you are and what you do. And this is the truth for just about every single aspect of this economic system. Even social entrepreneurs that have a good intention to make the world a better place are forced to abide by the rules of the economy and be profitable at some point and make money or die, no matter how good their intentions are. I know a company that has invented a modularized refugee home type system where refugees around the world can design their own homes that is cheaper than a Red Cross tent. Cradle to cradle, doesn't harm the environment at all. It's one of the greatest ideas in the world because one billion people today are refugees or live in slums. They've brought together some of the best brain work to develop something that can be done at that low cost. And they're going out of business. They've burned all their funding. The 40 people they needed to design it, they can't pay their salaries anymore. And nobody is willing to help them. That's the reality of the system because the good, well, not the good, but the bad news of that is a competitive system built on the economic environment that we're in today drives a tremendous consumption of resources. As we compete, we drive significantly more resource consumption than we have ever had in the history of the planet. The system is so efficient that currently we are utilizing 1.5 planets a year. 
And that trend is accelerating. No matter how good our intentions are on making it better, we're accelerating the eco-dilemma that we're eating up all the resources that we have and forcing countries on the planet where the children have no diapers to buy iPhones for their kids. What a great system have we invented. And what do we do on the process side of this model? Be it the vision strategy process, the structures that we decide to put in place for these companies, the processes needed to execute it, or the systems and technology put in place, we make them as efficient as we humanly can so that we can drive more products at lower cost, at higher quality, make more profit, and eat the planet two times a year and be proud of ourselves for doing it, get paid bonuses for doing it faster, get paid bonuses for laying off 50,000 people, and make money doing what this machine was intended to do. We can't blame the system. The system is efficient. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And the sad part of the story is, if it continues to do what it does, potentially civilization as we know it may no longer be viable because we can't sustain this environment for a longer period of time than maybe 30 to 50 years. So what's going to change? Are we going to take all of our efforts and process optimization and make this system better? Make it faster? Five years ago, 300 people, the 300 wealthiest people in the world, they fit in one airplane, amass as much wealth amongst themselves as the 3.5 billion poorest people on the planet. That same study was done in March of this year. It's now 80 people in the world that amass as much wealth as the 3.5 billion poorest people on the planet. In 10 years, it's probably going to be two. Now, I've got an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old at home. They're both girls. They don't need to go to college to understand that that's not a good system. <laughs> To put it plainly, I was going to use some bad, ugly words. We don't want to do that. They sometimes do. The kids sometimes do. So for me, when I worked in the system and I generated about $4.5 billion or more wealth for Michael Dell at the time, and I was proud of it. I thought it was great. At some point, I lost everything that was dear to me serving this system till I finally understood that there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way that we can use the efficiencies of this system that are really, really powerful, but to do them in a slightly different manner. Not just for myself and my friends, but for our kids and our kids' kids. Can we take this machine and do something good with it? Can we turn it around that we don't serve the machine, but the machine serves us? Every time I hear the worker word inside of me, my whole body starts to tremble that we reduce almost all of humanity down to a simple word like worker. Because only 0.1% of people in organizations are senior executives and leaders, and they decide what the rest of us do or do not. There's got to be a better way. And since I'm a systems guy, systems theory guy, and a Six Sigma, I'm sorry, not as cool as lean kind of guy, you know, but we did Six Sigma Lean, which was kind of a cool combination of both sides of the fence, you know. And I really want to understand things. So my Germanic side helped me over the seven years. We asked ourselves the question, if there was a single lever, and it was the most powerful lever in this existing system, what would it be and how could we turn that lever by only 0 .0001 degrees? And at that point, 0, 0, 0, 0001 degrees was sufficient to make a significant, significant change to the whole system. It would be really cool to know what it is. Are you guys still with me? Because you're systems guys. Yeah, you're process guys. So we tried to figure it out. We think we found it. I'm going to show you the next slide. Is that okay? Are you ready for that? Because this is a great, ugly slide. You don't want to know the city that that was taken at. You can probably guess where it is. Let's get to the next slide. The future looks a little bit brighter. I like this future. And basically, the lever is leadership. For us, we understand that if leadership could shift just one iota of its attention, just a little tiny bit of everything it does every single day to the most important asset in any organization on the planet, it is not the output of the system that's relevant, profit. It is those that drive it, the people. 
The people in every single organization are the most important asset. They're the lever point for anything you want to have happen. And they're always intrinsically motivated by themselves. You don't have to do anything to motivate anyone on this planet. We're born motivated. Connect and grow. Verbundenheit und Wachstum. Gerald Hüther, physiologist, really smart guy. So for us, and leaders in any organization, if we know that people are the driver of our success, then all we have to do is focus our attention on it. We heard it today, time and space made available to focus on the people part of our process. And that's driven by values. It's not driven by money. It's not driven by cars. It's not driven by iPhones or iPads. It's driven by values that connect us as human beings. Dignity, respect, trust, and appreciation are the elements that drive every single human being on this planet, irregardless of what culture they're from. I don't care if you're in the jungles of Tanzania, if you're in downtown Tokyo, or in uptown New York City. This baseline is what drives us between who we are and where we want to be that allow us to give everything we have into an organization and a team of others to perform at levels never seen before, to go beyond what the current system can do to places we've never been before in our organizations. And yes, process plays a part of that. But the nicest thing about the system, when people are put in the center and values are the corner point of what binds us together as individuals and teams, is that we go from a competitive system to a collaborative system. We allow all ideas to be valuable. We allow all options to be viable. And we find that combination where all the wisdom of humanity brought together in a collaborative manner allows us to achieve results faster in minutes and not in days. I spoke to a CEO recently who wants to save $100 million as quickly as possible. He's been driving his transformation plan for two years. And the net result is zero. He's only got 6,000 employees. I said, what if every one of your 6,000 employees would find $1,000 a month? And I tell you, they can. Because if they wanted, they could take their own salary and find $1,000 because they're making 10 a month in Germany at this company. They, we don't even ask that question. We drive it top down. We drive it process oriented. We expect it to be done the way we want it to be done. And we've forgotten all the things we learned in the 149,900 and 50 years before we got here. Leadership and team and organizations have always functioned different than we believe. And all of the research, be it from the psychological side or physio, uh, 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 physio to Deutsche is neuroscience, neuroscience side, all those elements prove to us what every one of us know is true. If we get in an environment where respect, trust, and appreciation allows us to unfold every one of our talents the way we would like to, we feel stronger. And the younger generation today that you see at your universities, they, they throb with that power. They throb with that energy. They actually do believe they can make this world a better place like we did when we were younger. What did we lose along the way? Hopefully, they will not. And the nicest thing about this young generation and the companies they go into when they inspire the others, us older ones, for the first time we say, they're right. The prior generations never told us we were right. They told us we were full of shit. <laughs> Finally, we can band across generations. The wise wisdom of those of us that have been around can be combined with the thriving vitality of the young. My friends in Japan do nothing else on one of these universities that we're at but interview people that are 90 years or older and try to note and record the wisdom that they have. In most companies in Europe, we push them out when they turn 65. That's when 40 sometimes even, right? You get these special programs at Hewlett Packard and IBM. You know, here, we want to give you, get you out of here. What we don't understand is that revelation and understanding sometimes takes a lot of years before it comes in a format where we can deliver it as coaches, as mentors, as leaders that can deliver that to any generation, any gender of any culture around the world. This new future 
is the future where strategy, vision, structure, and process serves the people in the center point. We can then go places with Lean and Six Sigma and any other type of idea that comes up that we never even tried before. We didn't try it because the system doesn't allow you to enable the 99.9% .9 at the bottom of the organization as an intrinsic automatic default. Lean wants to do that. The true philosophy of what I felt today is that the core of that is to enable and empower humanity to find its strength and ask humanity to find the condition that humanity would like to have, and then the product, services, and everything else will follow. That's the power of the world today and not the technology, the processes, or the methods, or the tools. And for us at Beyond Leadership, we have fun doing this everywhere we go because we asked ourselves after we figured this picture out, the only question we then had was what, two and a half years ago, once we had this picture? What do you think the question was? How? <laughs> you know, it's, I don't think we're going to get a big argument between picture number one, if you go back one page, please, gentlemen. You go back to this picture, and then you go front ways to this picture. You know, go forwards. No fauna, I'm a... No one's look. No one's fauna. No one's look. No one's fauna. Go look. You don't want to be in that world. Come on. And if the only vehicle that can get you out of it is lean or kata or any of the other great ideas you've had and you scientists have been able to prove repeatedly, well, then we should click it one more time and you should be the ones that build the vehicle to this future. Stop delivering to the old model and killing our planet and killing the relationship that make us happy when we're older, when we look back and are asked what was the most valuable part of your life. It wasn't the cars, it wasn't the jobs or the status. It was the relationships we lost that hurt us the deepest and the relationships we have that mean the most to us. And that's the future. And if we ask ourselves, we go to the final slide of the day, if changing that global economy is a viable course of action, and if we asked ourselves in your terminology, and now I'm going to try to be a lean guy, so bear with me. Today was my lean day number one, okay? If the only question is how, then the only question is which process do we go after? And if lean was complicated, I think that was our friend from Finland today, wherever you are. There you are, okay. If it's complex, right, if it's complicated, and I'll bear with you on that. Let it be complicated. So I'm going to say, you're right. <laughs> you convinced me. It's totally complicated, right? But what if we were able to reduce all the variations of the hundreds of millions of processes that are there down to one single process? What if there was one single process that drives all the other processes? What if there's one single process that influences the success or not success of everything humans do in the world? Would it be cool to know what that process is? I think that's your research project for between now and next year when you come back. Konstantin, what a cool aforong, ne? Well, that process is a very simple process. And the base of that process is called human interaction. The only process that is relevant in any organization for any task that humans have done since we've invented fire is based on interaction between human beings. That's the only process. And the nicest thing about this process, when you want to do learning by doing, you know, like training on a real process that your students have, well, guess what? They're doing that with each other a whole lot more than sitting in your class. They're doing human interaction since they were this little. And actually, we probably learned more about it from here to here than we learned about it in any university in the world because we neglect the most important human process in the history of mankind because we take it for granted. We take it for granted and we think it's natural, but it's not, it's a process. If you can measure it, Michael Dell always said, you can manage it. And we can measure the quality of interaction. My first training, I said I only went to high school because I didn't go to college, but in the United States Navy, they, treated, they trained me to be a meteorologist. Also a complex system. You agree with that one too? Yeah, weather, climate, totally complex, right? 
if we would call the quality of interaction with each other climate. In some languages, like in German, we call it Betriebsklima. We've used the word climate in regards to how we would measure the quality of how cool is it at work, right? So we call it interaction climate. We've got two research universities for the last year and a half where we've initiated research around the idea of what makes human interaction uh, low quality or high quality and how would you measure it. What are the elements in the atmosphere of interaction in the climate that you can measure? And how would you measure it? And the second question comes after that once you figure out how to measure it and how to show it is how do you influence it? See, when I was a, me a weather person in the Navy. It was kind of a cool job because when you start as a, a meteorologist, at the beginning, you're called a weather observer, which is like a really complicated job, right? Because like once an hour, you just go outside and then you go in and you write it down and then you take a break for about another 59 minutes, which is if you're in the Navy, it's kind of a cool job to have because there's other jobs in the Navy that aren't so cool. You know, when you get really advanced because, you know, if you observe something long enough, and you observe it detailed, because we actually, when you're a weather observer, you get all the data. You get data from satellites, you get data from all kinds of instruments, and you're putting all the data together, so you're observing in scientific detail. And all of you that are scientists know, the more you observe, the more you can learn. And at some point, when you're you know, out there observing the weather, and you see this big black cloud thingy, and you see this lightning coming, and you see the wind is in your face coming at you, you do what the next phase of meteorology is, is you go, I think it's going to rain here in 10 minutes. My kids can do that, you know? Let's go inside. It looks like it's going to rain. There's thunder coming. That's called weather forecasting. That's the second level of mastery after you understand by observation is to be able to, you know, interpret the potential of what's going to happen. You forecast the future. You do a hypothesis. You try, try it out. You figure it out. You learn, right? Well, there's a third level of weather mastery after observing weather and forecasting weather. What is that third level? What do you think? You make weather. <laughs> it's, if you did it for Mars, it'd be terraforming. That's like the highest level of mastery. We still can't really do that yet, okay? But what we're saying is if climate is measurable, if it's observable, if we could understand the driving factors of what makes quality happen in interactions and in relationships, then we could manage it with all the tools that you've got. Everything that Lean stands for, why not apply it to the most important process in any organization? And it's the reason why all of your projects fail when they do fail. They don't all fail. I mean, you know what I mean, right? They don't all fail, but sometimes they fail. And when they fail, it's because of what's called the human factor. But no one goes into the human factor to understand it and to document it and to show it so that you can deal with it. And that's our task at Beyond Leadership. We're going to do everything we can to find and understand the mechanisms that drive this one single process. Because then it's not complicated anymore. You know what I mean? And if you can trust that if you can take, and we use maturity grades, and we probably learned that from you guys, because one of my guys who's here, Renee, he's at the back, he's a, a lean guy. I didn't know this that until I told him we're coming here. He said, hey, I did that for lots of years. I'm a lean educator. I said, that's awesome. You guys basically have all of the Voraussetzungen, is a German word, all of the prerequisites to apply yourselves to that one single process and make it total quality management of human interaction and inter interaction climate. And every single project that fails because of the human factor today would no longer fail. Because if people are connected, and we've you know, discovered some mechanisms of how that process works, we've you know, discovered some methods and instruments, not of just how to measure it, but how to influence it. And then we've observed teams, like police SWAT teams. They've got them in Italy, too. You know, like, what do they call them in Italy? The special police that go in. Yeah, that's the, you know, that's the police. Yeah, and they go in there, and these guys are experts. And they have a certain system that they utilize to make sure that they're at a very, very high level of connection. Right? Very, very high level. Respect, trust, all the really high level. So if you would analyze all the highest performing teams of any organization around the world today, you would find all these factors again. It's, is that a coincidence? You're scientists. You tell me. It's not a coincidence. It's how human beings work. The best place to watch that is in Fuspa. 
Schland. That's okay, that's for the Germans in there. That means we're world champion. That's the German way of saying, world champion, right? Deutschland. Well, guess what? That's where you see it strongest. When a team engages deeply with one another and then aligns, I heard that word a whole lot from you guys today, aligns to the purpose of what they're there for strongly, and then they commit to each other to give their life to win this game. You always can tell the difference when the player that says, I'm giving my life for this game, and the other one saying, I'm going to win, uh, earn a million dollars today, right? You can tell the difference right away. And these are the mechanisms that in the course of our only purpose to be here, my personal dream, is to make that new world a reality for my kids so that when they go to work, they're not classified down to be a worker to execute a process. That they get the opportunity with dignity and respect and trust and appreciation. And the German word for appreciation is much more powerful. It's called Wert Schätzung. It's valuing the value of the human being. This is deeper. I want every single person in the world to have that every single minute of every single day. And if it takes the rest of my life, I'm going to do everything I can with all my friends that join me, with everyone that goes through our academy, which is the only school in the world that teaches it right now, because if I had another school, I'd be hiring these guys into my business, so that we can go out and allow that to happen. And the nicest thing about this process is you don't have to train anybody. You don't have to coach anybody. You don't have to mentor anybody. You don't even have to use a flip chart or a PowerPoint slide or an Excel sheet. Because everybody knows how human interaction works. Everybody knows what it's like to be a human. I would hope. With the exception of some of the CEOs I've met recently, I got to tell you, they're borderline on the human thing. You know, I think they go to the special school somewhere in the world, the special school of where you don't only have first names. You know, George, Frank, Ed, you know, only got first names because they've got the human part, but they forgot the being part. And you can't be human unless you're being human. And to be human, you got to do at least one thing a day that someone would classify as being human, like say thank you, good morning, you are totally awesome. How many CEOs say that? A couple do that, they're the good CEOs, okay? So if you ever go into a room, you just listen for five minutes. If you hear those four or five words, you're in a good company with a good CEO. If you don't hear those four or five words, you should remind them about the being thing. So have you heard that story, Ed? Don't forget the last name. It's where we're from in every culture around the world. Like my Chinese name, Kong Tai De. It means something, and meaning is what drives the world. And I firmly believe that for you guys, where you're from and what you represent, you have access to everything that's needed to build the vehicle between the world today and the world of the future. It all starts with that one little spark of you saying you want to. Because when you want to, you'll start teaching that way. If you want to, you'll start managing your projects that way. If you want to, you'll start looking at every single interaction you have and every single relationship you have on that basis. Am I doing something in this simple process to improve the quality of our condition? So the only condition that I talk about in my business is the human condition. Our whole history of civilization has been about improving the human condition. So if I give you one little thing to do, stop improving the profit condition at all these companies. Start improving the human condition because profit will follow. In a collaborative system, we will be able to leverage a whole lot more on a lot less resources than in a competitive system. Those of you that are in academia, you know how that works because you guys work a whole lot better together than any company I've ever met. So for me, and that was part of my element that I wanted to share with you guys today, it is my personal dream. It's my life. I've got a lot of friends, more and more, that are joining me because they believe it's right to do. And everywhere I go, this is the message I share. If you can take that step and believe that this future world is worth striving for, then no matter what your role is, no matter where you're at, ask yourself the question, what can I do to contribute? 
How can I go after this one single process? And if we've got enough of you guys in the world going after that one single process, we will figure it out. We will find a way to build that vehicle together. And I don't think it's going to happen without lean. I don't think it's going to happen without that spirit that's deep inside of what you guys are all about. And when I do my Aikido, I try to take all of those elements of what Aikido is all about and transport that into the power of connecting because that's how we will improve the human condition forever. Thank you very much. Questions for Patrick? Yeah, I made it a little shorter for you guys, so we should be okay. I'm just wondering, what's your opinion about the current state? Is the current state your, your, your first slide with the cars, or is the current state further towards the green? Because big companies like, uh, like Philips, and there are many more companies, they are very much busy with cradle to cradle, with uh, new product development, uh, UGAT innovation, perhaps you've heard of UGAT innovation in, in India. There, there's a huge movement going on. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm interested in your opinion about that. I think what I heard from Philips is that the, the big companies are, are, are they, they want, they are very much busy. But the problem is, is the consumers. The consumers is a big problem. Right? Philips does have a, a cradle to cradle senseo, but it's too expensive for, for consumers. So. What's your feeling about the status, the current situation? Yes. Thank you. So the question is, where do I feel the current status is between the gray and the green, if we would take the colors of the two slides? And the reason I use the gray one is because I know that's where it's at. Because even Philips or Nestle or any of the other companies we would look at, um, they're in the paradigm. So even if they want to make a product better, they want to sell more products. <laughs> they want to sell more products. It's not about not selling more products, but we're going to make them greener so that we can you know, impact the situation a little bit better. For me, that's fine. That's, that's a, maybe it's a great intention. Maybe there's some great potential in that. But what I'm saying is it's working inside the paradigm. And, in, and I read that from the guy that did the 14 thesis thingy that I, heard, I looked it up on Google, you know, this, the older gentleman who no longer lives, but the, went to Japan. And he, yeah, this guy, right? And, and I read in there the, the, these elements of if you, if, you, if you don't go out of the system, you can't fix the system, right? You have to go out of the system in order to understand the paradigm of where that future condition is to fix it. Most of these companies, and I worked for a lot of them at very senior executive positions, um, that, that doesn't drive them at all. It's not on that Friday agenda of the CEO of Philips. That is not part of the agenda. Seriously not. It, it, it seriously is not, okay? And so for me, un unless that changes, then the eco-dilemma, if you look at the speed of, of, of what's happening ecologically, it's, it's accelerating, as a matter of fact. So it's not even slowing down. So for me, my statement is, I'm going to keep Philips and the guys in the gray box until they scream at me loudly and ask the question, which process do we have to fix? Because it's not cradle to cradle. It's the human process where they have to begin. Because if you don't care about your people, except that they're part of delivering money into your pocket, then you're never going to care about the planet at all. So what I'm saying is I'm going to be the Diablo for these guys. And some of them like me for that. Most of them hate me for that. And I do go visit as many of them as I can because the 500 top CEOs own 52% of the planet. So someone's got to go talk to these guys. They've got to get out of the box. So my answer is they're gray until they convince me and all my friends and hopefully all of you that they're out of the box and they're fundamentally changing their business model to a new business model at any price. Because if you take all the billions of dollars that they've amassed over the last 100 years of profit, and it's been almost all profitable for them, um, they've got to put that somewhere. Because if they don't, it's going to get worse and not get better. So for me, my answer is 
They're in the gray box, even if that was a China picture. It could be, at some point, it's going to be Amsterdam. That looks like that. And it'll be underwater, by the way. You know? You guys got, all got to go to Deutschland and figure it out, right? Because you're underwater in, 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 in Holland. It's the same, you know? What, it's, this can't be the answer. So... Oh, I would immediately, uh, I would immediately begin asking the question about this one process element and figure out how that can impact the rest of my business. I would put a process in place, a continuous improvement program on this one element of my company because if that becomes the baseline, then every strategic decision I make, I can no longer make as a CEO. I got to have 220,000 people make the strategic decision for my company and I've got to make, I've got, they will decide. And there's collaborative systems today where you can, 220,000 people can be involved in a strategic decision and they will make a smarter decision than the dumb shit at the top of the organization. Guaranteed. Because there's no way that your IQ is going to be 220,000 times X. It's not. And there's enough research on swarm intelligence and organizational intelligence and who knows what for the last 40 years that could prove that beyond the benefit of a doubt that that's true. But if you take the ego of that CEO, mostly, they think my business is only going to be successful because of me. And when it fails, they're going to say, it's only failing because of all of you. You know, that, that's a paradigm that they're stuck in. And I always tell the CEOs, if you and your board would go to Tahiti, and I'm going to shank it to you. I got enough money, which I don't have, but I'm going to shank you a three-year trip to Tahiti with all kinds of beautiful palm trees. <laughs> and I tell you, when you come back in three years, your company's going to be working better than it is now. And the day that they go, you're right, is the day they probably start doing the right thing. But as long as they think that they're the reason it works, and every process person knows that's not true, there's no way that one thing at the top can, can run the whole system. So I'm sorry for the emotional part of that, but thank you for that question. Any, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah, OK. I saw a hand back there. I have a question. Oh, here we go, right here, sorry. So thanks a lot for that, it was really inspirational, I think. Um, and I have a question about it. I read an article uh, recently, and it was about the 15 hours work week. And it was about that up until the 80s, uh, people were working harder, or let's say, using wealth to buy more time, to get more free time. And that from the 80s up until now, that we're working longer to buy more stuff. And I would like to, hear your vision about that. What do you think about that evolution? Oh, okay. Um, that sounds like a really bad number. So all I can say is if we're working harder and having less, and I'm not saying material goods, and that's why the younger generation is driving a little bit different because they're not driving for material goods. All our kids or grandkids have got a different view. Um, yeah, I, I, I can only judge the last 30 years I was in the system. And all I notice is was this statement that was made in all of those companies, irregardless of Japan, America, or Germany. And the mantra was always more with less. So for us, I mean, we work more with less resources. And for the senior executives, it was work less for more money. You know, so we have a, a paradigm problem in the system. And a, a billionaire in the States who owns part of Amazon just wrote a long letter to the other billionaires. He said, you know, if we don't, if we don't pay enough attention, at some point someone's going to take some sticks and start whooping on us, okay? Because it, there's no way that can sustain. So that situation can't sustain. Now, there, this is philosophy. We'd have to go drink. Let's go drink. Okay, because I'm thirsty now. So you catch me outside. I'm going to stay here another couple hours before I have to head out to Karlsruhe. And anybody wants to have a discussion, we can have a discussion. But some discussions need alcohol as part of it. Otherwise, you can't. You, know, you just can't handle the, the, the issue so much. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any, any other um, questions? Oh, here. Uh, so my question is... Oh, oh there. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so maybe less uh, philosophical, more pragmatic. Um, Thank you. Uh, first off, um, it goes without saying that I really enjoy every second of your presentation. So thank you for that. Um, uh, second of all, I mean, your, uh, some of your talk is, um, um, is addressing or tackling some of the basic elements of capitalism. Uh, one of which is, for example, the rewarding uh, mechanism or rewarding system of leadership. Yes. What kind of, what is your um, vision uh, um, when it comes to rewarding a leadership uh, with the terminology, 
not from the gray world, but from the green world. How do you want to sustain or um, having a sustainable rewarding system for leadership to foster the economy or, I mean, uh, uh, sustain economy? Yes. Okay, so the question is, how would you reward leadership to sustain the, the green model versus the gray model? Um, well, I think one of the most important things to understand is that monetary systems don't motivate the reward systems don't work. And the guy I read about that you guys mentioned today, right, in his 14 things, he, he's got like this big anti-target setting, measuring system thingy, right? Because when you get judgmental on people, uh, why should a leader be able to give you a, a, a grade between A and F? And, you know, that whole system sucks. So my answer to that is the current system of how to reward stuff is stuck in the old paradigm because that is not what the human process is striving for as a reward. Connecting to each other is a base element of the human condition. When we're born, it's the mother, usually, that we have that strong connection to because we're being fed. Yeah? And, and when a CEO doesn't believe me that that is a strong binding connection, I just tell him, if your CFO would suck on your nipple for six months, you guys would have a much closer relationship than you have now. <laughs> yeah. I, I do that on purpose sometimes, right? So... I'm not saying that that's the reward for leaders that you get to suck on a CEO or something, but that's kind of new. Renee, you got to write that one down. That's a good one. So what we're saying is if we understand the human condition and the process, we would understand what the reward system is. And the two elements that are most intrinsic in the human condition are connecting and growing or learning. Um, and that's a baseline for every single human in the world. If we can address that in our systems, the way leadership would work would change significantly which is why we call it beyond leadership. Yeah? There's a different leadership model emerging in a lot of the ideas around the world, be it the Otto Sharma approach, the design thinking guys, all these people have great ideas. All of them are viable in one way or another, but most of them forget the process underneath because some of your charts were good because down there was the people thing, but then you delve all your attention into the stuff on top um, I'm thinking, you know, 90% is going here. You put a little bit more down here. You don't need to put so much more up top. So the reward system isn't relevant if you activate the people because then the leadership thing almost goes away completely, I believe. Theory. You know, we need to go do an experiment now or something, which with alcohol works good too. Or if you guys want, Renee's doing the workshop tomorrow where he shows you one or two of the methods and you just do it. You know, you just, you just practice a very basic human thing and once you do it, you'll probably never forget it, and you'll probably say, I've not done this with anybody close to me in the last 10 years. So that's tomorrow afternoon, in case you're still here. Okay. Great. Well, uh, actually, we're, we're all out of time for the formal part, uh, but Patrick, we're glad to hear you're going to be here with us for a couple hours and uh, have a chance uh, to uh, perhaps have a, a beverage and, uh, and talk about it. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thanks, man.